So I guess um, along the lines of uh, the talk this morning by Dr. Gopal, um, a lot of the training does involve uh, hemodialysis. However, as I finished and moved on, there's a lot of peritoneal dialysis that uh, we're actually doing. So I'll spend some time to talk a little bit about uh, bowel impedance in um, peritoneal dialysis. I don't have any disclosures. Uh, I wish I have, but don't have any. <laughs> um, so objectives really is to first describe what is bowel, bowel impedance, why it's important, and along the lines of that, um, following Dr. Rimbo's talk is, it's actually really sad state of affairs for the evidence on why it's actually important, and we'll, you'll see why. And later, bowel impedance versus other standards for measuring volume and when to use bowel electrical impedance. So first off, what is bioelectrical impedance? Oh, okay, it's doing that thing again. I'm gonna skip that, okay. We're okay. <laughs> um, you might have seen some of these uh, before and maybe some of you have them in your bathrooms. Um, the one on the right is the just typical bathroom scale, but these are the fancy ones that you step on and it tells you how much you weigh and in addition to that, it tells you how much fat you have. So. <laughs> These are the fancy ones. And the one on the left there is actually very, uh, it's almost the same thing, but without the scale component. So it's the ones that you have at the health spas or the gyms, and you grab it, you tell them how much, how much you weigh, and again, tells you how much um, fat you have. These are the consumer models, less sophisticated than the ones we use in the dialysis units. So what exactly is bioimpedance? Well, it's a simple way for us to determine the body composition. The gold standard is, of course, ditrium dilution, so that's heavy water. But as you can imagine, it's quite complicated to, um, to actually do. You have to inject something, you have to take something out of the body, do some calculations, and then calculate body composition. So one easy method to measure hydration status in all the different compositions of the body is to do bowel impedance. How that works is it's based on conductivity of uh, an alternating current. So not direct current, but alternating current at the, cell, at the cellular level. It, there's different frequencies that gets applied, and, and low frequencies such as those in around the one kilohertz area passes through uh, the extracellular fluids, so avoids the cells, just the extracellular fluids, and the higher frequency, so anywhere between 500 to 800 kilohertz, passes through the extracellular and the intracellular uh, fluids, and I'll have a diagram to highlight that again. And as the body is an imperfect conductor, it, um, we're able to calculate the resistance as well as some energy storage, the reactance to this. And now, again, it'll, it'll become a little bit more apparent in the next couple of slides. These are the medical grade ones. And um, the one on the right is the RJL systems used in some dialysis studies and some uh, physiology studies. The one on the left is the Fresenius machine. It's the uh, BCM monitor. And you may or may not have seen it um, in some literature or outside. I, didn't, I don't think I saw it outside, but it could be out there. Um, the one, they're both really similar in terms of uh, the reporting, but um, the one on the left, the Fresenius machine, actually has uh, more frequencies, and it, uh, for those that are using the Fresenius 5008 dialysis machine, it is compatible with those cards, so it has some benefits there. But they're both similar, and they've been both reported in the medical literature. So how does it work? So these machines, so you see there on the, on the left-hand side, there's a diagram of a person. The, mis the machine is represented as that box. And there's two connectors, uh, um, two to the upper limb, two to the lower limb. And uh, what, what happens is that on the top there, different currents are applied. At the top, it's, say, no frequency. Um, it's, it's basically, at this point, just current running through. And it's all the currents passing through the extracellular water. Now, as the frequency is applied, and it, this occurs at various frequencies, it's actually um, passing through part of the cell. And by subtracting the, the measurements, there, where it, the machine is able to calculate out what uh, the composition of the cells are. And again, different frequencies show different things. So how do we attach this to the patient? Well, this is a diagram from the RJL manual. And it's actually very extremely easy to, to perform this uh, procedure. So two electrodes to the upper limb, two to the lower limb. In the upper limb, it's um, right in the, uh, the middle of the part of the middle finger and uh, at, the at the level of the ulnar, on the, usually typical on the right hand. And on the foot, it's at the level of the metatarsal, as shown in the diagram there, and at the level of the medial malleolus, so an imaginary line bisecting it. And that's basically all it is. And there's different diagrams. The Fresenius machine has a similar setup. The electrodes look a little bit different, 
but for the most part, the principle is exactly the same. And which, which um, wire goes to which spot? Again, it's very simple. The diagrams are there. Um, in the RJL machine, I believe the mnemonic, uh, or the way to remember, remember it is red to head. I think that's how they advertise it, but similar. So how do we actually do it? Well, we've got a, got a couple of things that in the peritoneal dialysis patient that we have to keep in mind. And one is that first we have to make sure that our patient has an empty abdomen. They cannot or should not have fluid indwelling. As you can imagine, we're passing current through the body and we're measuring the reactants and the resistance. And having fluid can change that measurement. So there's some studies that looked at what the effect of uh, fluid is on bowel impedance, uh, at least in the, in the belly. And they, what they were able to find is that uh, by having a full belly of fluid, peritoneal dialysis fluid, it actually increased the total body water, as you can imagine, and reduced the fat-free mass calculation. So it gives us an abnormal number. Uh, in addition to that, we, need, we should advise the patient to avoid any alcohol, uh, caffeine within the last next uh, within a couple hours prior to the procedure, avoid saunas and exercise. And the reason for that is because of fluid shifts and electrolyte shifts that can, again, change the measurement. Metallic or magnetic objects should be removed. So if they have a metallic watch on the ipsilateral hand or even contralateral hand uh, or a necklace, uh, that should be removed. Pacemakers and defibrillators aren't, uh, aren't tested, and we should really avoid that in the, those patients. Now, there was one study that looked at defibrillators specifically and bowel impedance, and they found it to be safe. However, um, not all makes and models of defibrillators have been tested. So again, again, don't just play safe. Don't really do that. Um, and lastly, if someone has a metallic joint, so like a, a metallic joint or a re joint replacement, uh, you can always do the bowel impedance on the contralateral side of that joint. So after you've gone through that little checklist, you gotta make sure the patient is laying flat, limbs are spread apart, and they're not moving. Because again, moving, there's electrical current um, flowing through the body. Uh, limbs are apart because you don't want to have conductivity uh, through the other limb. Attach electrodes as per the instructions, and as shown on the previous diagrams, and then follow the instructions on the machine. And each machine is a little bit different. The Fresenius machine will ask for the measurements of the person, so weight, height, um, gender, and whereas the RGL machine, you just hook it up and it'll spit out the numbers. So what are you supposed to get? What, what are the readouts? What information are we getting? Well, the Fresenius machine, because you've already entered in uh, some, a lot of the numbers it requires, so height, weight, gender, it will give you two numbers, two, two, one, two of the numbers that we really uh, follow in the um, dialysis patients. And that's hydration status or overhydration in this OH, uh, how many percent they're over. And it will also provide how much extra volume they have in terms of liters. The other machine, the RJL machine, it, the, you haven't entered anything in, so it'll just give you the raw numbers. So the resistance, so that's uh, how, the, how much the body is resisting the current. Uh, the reactants, the ability to store energy, so again, I mentioned that um, the body is an imperfect conductor, so it's kind of like a capacitor in that sense. And the phase angle. And so this is actually represented by the two diagrams that try to explain this concept. Um, and it didn't, uh, didn't really project that well, but. On, the, on that little circular diagram there, the x-axis is actually the, res uh, the resistance, and then the y-axis is the uh, reactance. And so the time delay between the two gives us that phase angle. I wouldn't worry much about the phase angle at this point. It'll become a little bit more apparent uh, closer to the end of the talk why I even talk about this. But it is a reported number uh, in the RGL machine. So now we take all these numbers and we plug it into the computer. And we get a couple. We get a couple of uh, couple of things. In this example, this is a hemodialysis patient, um, but the idea still stands. Uh, so this is a patient, 148 kilograms. She's female, uh, 57 years old, and we have the raw numbers of the resistance and the reactants that was uh, plugged in. There, it, get, it spits out a whole bunch of numbers: fat, fat-free mass, lean, dry mass. But the ones that we really care about is the total body water, so TBW. Uh, which she has quite a bit of, 35% uh, of her weight is uh, water, and the intracellular water as well as the extracellular water, 15% uh, and 19%. Again, it gives you the different weights of those uh, volumes. So this, this patient is uh, excessively fluid overloaded. So now, if you have the 
the Fresenius machine, it'll just tell you how many liters are over, it does all the calculations for you. But in, in case you don't, here's what the ratios actually mean and what the numbers reported actually mean. Um, there's different reference ranges and it all depends on the age, the gender, and the body type that the person has. In general, we look at the ECW, so extracellular water to the intracellular water, and the normal, again, depending on which study that you uh, quote, it's about 0.63 or 0.75 as the ratio. Um, the, the another ratio that can be used uh, in dialysis is extracellular water to total body water ratio, and that, again, is approximately 0.42 as the normal. Um, so that tells you, that's a, you, based on that, you're able to calculate, well, does this person have excess water? Do they, are they euvolemic or are they hypo, underhydrate or hypovolemic? Um, and to calculate out, if you want to get fancy, you want to calculate out exactly how much they're excess, you can do some simple algebra. Uh, and that's shown there. So, for example, you can take 0.63 equals to the ECW over the ICW and uh, do some algebra. So swing the uh, IC. Uh, swing the ICW over in the next step there, and you can actually get the expected ECW. Now, expect, actual minus expected gives you the excess water. The overhydration that the first senius uh, machine gives is actually based loosely on this. So then it, you can take it one step further and, and um, take the excess water divided by the extracellular water, and that gives you the hydration or percent hydration uh, if you multiply by 100. So it, uh, it, they're, very, they're all interrelated and you can actually calcul calculate out the overhydration or percent hydration using whatever machine you want. So now we move on to back to the sad state of affairs and why bioimpedance is actually important in um, the peritoneal dialysis population. So mortality is really high in our dialysis population and in hemo it's actually, actually worse than this. It's about 50, I believe it's 57 percent, I want to say, a five-year mortality for all comers based on the latest core data. Now, peritoneal dialysis, a little bit better, but all comers, five-year mortality, about 45 percent. And there's a lot of reasons for this, and some of it is uh, cardiovascular, sudden death. Um, uh, it could be infection, could be a stroke, and there there's now more evidence saying that perhaps this is from hypertension and hypervolemia, and that's why bioimpedance is uh, playing a role in this. So first off, I want to spend a, just a few minutes talking about hypertension. Again, evidence isn't great. Most of this, these concepts are from hemodialysis, and even in the hemodialysis population, uh, this is mostly, we know hypertension is mostly due to hypervolemia. Not so clear-cut in PD, but we'll, we'll demonstrate that. Uh, in this, this is just to show that um, the association between mortality and blood pressure in the hemo patient. Um, on the a study of over 5,000 patients, blood pressure measured uh, during the initial 90 days, and then they followed them for 90 years. Uh, sorry, five years, I mean, my mistake. 90 years, I wish. Uh, five years. And what we see here is that lovely U-shaped curve. Um, so as the blood pressure on the extremes, blood pressure increases or blood pressure gets very low, uh, the mortality increases. Now, is it the same thing in peritoneal dialysis? And that, we'll show you one study here. This is a study of um, a little over 100 patients, incident peritoneal dialysis patients that's been on for more than 90 days. They did one initial blood pressure. And then they followed them for five years, looked at the mortality. This was just a Dutch study. And they found that for each 10 millimeters mercury rise in blood pressure, systolic, they had a 42% increase in mortality. So, okay, one blood pressure. Don't know what to really make of that, but something there. Um, in this other study, so the similar type of design, they over 1,000 patients this time, not, again, 90 days on peritoneal dialysis, and they did one blood pressure. Um, they looked at mortality at two years, and they found that it doesn't have that lovely U-shaped curve uh, at the extremes of blood pressure. They just have that increased mortality at lower blood pressures. So not so sure anymore. Well, perhaps there's a time component to this, and this is the, the last day I'll talk more uh, about blood pressure mortality. 2,700 patients, again, this time they did a little bit better. They didn't just measure blood pressure once, but they measured blood pressures on a quarterly basis. And they followed them for various, they just split it up into the various time frames half a year to one year, and then from the second year onward to the third year, and the, fourth, uh, the beginning of the fourth year to the end of the fourth year, and so forth. 
and in both adjusted and, un un and unadjusted models, so looking at considering for their comorbidity to residual urine output, um, they found that there was a 10 increase, 10 percent increase in mortality per each 10 millimeter mercury in systolic blood pressure, and that's only true after six years. Before any of that. Um, it was all new or it actually may have been protective. So it may be a time-dependent type thing. It might not be a, a significant effect. So blood pressure might be um, not all there. So if it's not the blood pressure, could this high mortality be also a, be a result of the hypervolemia? And again, hypervolemia is very well described in the hemodialysis population. This is one of the uh, landmark studies uh, in the, more in the, for hypervolemia in hemodialysis. In this study, what they did was they took close to 270 patients' hemodialysis. They did bound impedance at the beginning, uh, and they used this hydration status. So thinking back to the principles of uh, the bound impedance, they used 15% overhydration as a cutoff. So they split that, they stratified by that. And that works out to be, if we want to give it a number, two and a half liters. And they followed them for, uh, I believe it was 60 months here. And they, there was a all cause mortality, adjusted all cause mortality of hazard ratio of 2.1. So there was increase in mortality in those that had higher uh, volume. Now you can't go anywhere, or at least in hemodialysis, without hearing about the tasks and experience. And for those that um, are aware, this is a town in France, and they traditionally get away from that four hours, three times a week hemodialysis. They do more the long dialysis, so six to eight hours. They do dry weight reduction, try to bring their weight down in about a month of, from average of 64 to 62 kilograms, and they limit the salt intake. Most of these patients have very normal uh, blood pressure reduction. They're mostly normal tensive, so from a map of 121 to 108 over the course of a month. So now, this, there's this one study. They took this reference group from France and compared it to a, German, uh, a group from Germany. And on the left there, um, it, the, on the left-hand side, it actually shows it splits the group up into different hydration statuses. So on the two left, or the, the one on the far left of that left diagram is the reference group uh, from France. The middle column there is the non-hyperhydrated group, so less than 15% uh, in Germany. And then on the right there is over 15%. And then they follow them for mortality outcomes over six and a half year time period. And what they found was that those that had less than 15% hydration, so the group from France, as well as the non-hyperhydrated group from Germany, uh, they actually had similar mortalities. And the, the group that did the worst was the overhydrated group from Germany. And when they did the analysis in terms of blood pressure and hydration, they found that as the hydration status increased and the blood pressure increased, the mortality was the highest. Well, what about peritoneal dialysis? Well, we're in that sad state of affairs, and um, there's one study that's uh, been described, it, but it hasn't been reported yet, and this is the iPod study in peritoneal dialysis. Um, I believe this is done, I can't remember the location, actually, where this multi-center, multi I believe, is international, and uh, it's over 1,000 PD patients, and they're, they're doing bowel impedance at different time frames. So they're doing it before they get on peritoneal dialysis at T, time minus three months, one month before, and then every three months moving forward, and they're gonna follow them for five years. And this study was uh, first, the, the, the initial um, baseline uh, characteristics were first published last year. So we've got a couple more years to go before we see the results of the study. Well, what about blood pressure and hydration? Is there an association with, uh, with this in peritoneal dialysis? It's touched on in hemodialysis. Well, in PD, one study uh, really describes this a uh, little bit better than others, and this one was a little over 600 patients. They did bowel impedance and they did uh, blood pressure measurements, and this was a cross-sectional study. And on, on the x-axis there, it's actually the how many liters are positive, and on the y-axis is the blood pressure. It looks like a, someone took a shotgun and just sprayed it, um, sprayed the chart there. So there's, believe it or not, when they did the analysis, there was some correlation and it was statistically significant for what it's worth. Uh, so for about 0.9% tissue hydration per millimeter of mercury, systolic blood pressure. So perhaps some association there, maybe not as strong as the hemo, hemo data. Well, can, if we took these patients and we removed their fluid, are we able to control their 
uh, blood pressure. And this, this study looked, tried to answer that question. And what they found was that when patients, uh, the normal tense of patients tend to have more sodium removal, so compared to the hypertensive patients, um, 218 millimoles per day versus 136, and they had more fluid removal, 1.8 liters versus 1.3 liters. Um, they also followed them for mortality, and they found, well, the, these patients um, had 10% mortality reduction for each 10 millimole per day and uh, 100 milliliters per day uh, of uh, fluid removal. So perhaps there might be some benefit there. And just to hit the point, uh, just to finish this off, um, there's lower volume and lower salt equal lower blood pressure. This was a very small interventional study, uh, only 47 patients that began, and they did this in a stepwise method. Um, they first did apply salt reduction, try to get uh, these hypertensive patients, uh, their blood pressures under control, and then subsequently, what they did was, uh, if they were, if the blood pressure was not less than 140 on 90, they applied extra ultrafiltration. And only by that, by that step, by the ultrafiltration step, uh, they only had about 17 patients that actually required that. So very small numbers, but um, the blood pressure systolic went from 160 to 118. So we see a nice drop in blood pressure. So perhaps volume and salt does equal um, lower blood pressure. And they tar this, uh, this study, they targeted a normalized X-ray cardiothoracic ratio, so not, not bioimpedance. Um, now, we know that with, uh, with peritoneal dialysis, residual renal function does play a big role in survival, and that's been shown in multiple studies. Well, you're gonna, a lot of people are going to ask, well, if we take off all this volume in our patients, will this actually reduce our residual renal output for our patients? And there's some studies that looked at this. This one's not, a, not the best study, but it's... The best we uh, one of the best ones we have, and this was a, a, a little over 120 patients, uh, peritoneal dialysis, and it was a retrospective study. They did bowel impedance at the baseline, and then they looked at uh, the different ratio, ECW to total body water ratio. This one they split it up into they used 0.396. So if you remember from the earlier slide uh, on how to interpret the ratios, um, the, the reference ratio is 0.42 or thereabouts for the total, uh, extracellular water to total body water. So this is very close to that. And then they looked at the urine output. And what they, and then so now in the, in the middle column there, that's group one, so that's the extracellular water to total body water ratio of less than 0.396. And the far right column, not, not the p-value, but the far right one, group two, was the extracellular water to total body water of more than uh, 0.3996. And they were not able to find any difference in the residual renal function and the urine output. So that's a little bit reassuring. In another small study, um, 30 patients this time, so we're getting smaller and smaller numbers. Uh, they, this, this group looked at PD patients. They did their hydration via bowel impedance, and this, this time they used the Fresenius machine. Uh, they measured it at baseline, at one year, and then two years uh, following. And at and, and then they looked at their, over, their hydration status and split it up and looked at their residual urine output and uh, hydration status. And so on the left-hand side, there's a different hydration uh, status throughout time. And so you can see that there's actually a lot of excess volume in our patients. For the most part, uh, on average, patients are about 6.7% overhydrated. So based on their paper, based on their population, this is about two, more than two liters of excess volume. So quite a bit of uh, volume on board. On the right uh, figure there, they stratified the groups by anuric versus urine output more than 250 milliliters per day. And so you can see that the dark colored is the anuric group and the light colored uh, box plots are those with urine output, uh, more than 250 cc's. And they, they, there was no significant uh, between, difference between the two groups. So again, perhaps drying them out or getting them back to euvolemia is not going to change the residual uh, renal function. Again, small studies. One thing to keep in mind is that our high transporters do tend to carry more fluid, so perhaps if someone is a high transporter, we don't have to worry so much about uh, uh, getting them under or dehydrated. And so this, this is a, the, the cross-sectional study that I talked about earlier, uh, and they, looked, they measured different uh, hydration statuses at baseline and looked at their transporter status, and they found that 56% of the fast transporters were actually overhydrated, and that makes sense because they're, they're fast transporters, they're gonna have problems of ultrafiltration. So 
just supports that a little bit more. So what about bound impedance versus other measures of volume? Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about com bound impedance compared to clinical assessment at this point. It's gonna save it for a little bit later, but I just have a, two slides on some of the data involving bound impedance versus some of the laboratory uh, investigation and ultrasound techniques. And one of them is comparing to BNP. Um, it's not a great study, very small, 175 uh, pay PD patients. And they, again, measured bound impedance and did BNP every three months. And what they found was that there seemed to be some correlation, again, not a great, not a great correlation between BNP and bound impedance. Those that were overhydrated on above that line um, used, had a BNP cutoff of over 150 to 200 for the most part. And those that were either normal hydrated or under hydrated did not have, have an elevated BNP. So some comparison there. Um, not very strong data, but it, that, that's what exists out there. And then last, uh, lastly, before moving on to the clinical uh, comparison is bowel impedance versus lung ultrasound. Um, we don't typically do this in Calgary. I'm not sure if it's done uh, at other sites, but lung ultrasound, they look at the comets uh, as a measure of uh, volume. And in PD, uh, lung ultrasound versus uh, bowel impedance, there's some correlation, although not great. Um, lung ultrasound versus, and BNP also did correlate as well. But again, very, if you look at the R values, we're looking at 0 0.4, 0 0.3, and 0 0.6. So very, um, not very good correlations. And again, small study. So now when to use bioimpedance, and I think that's more the clinical aspect of things. Well, first is volume. What I've been talking about all uh, this whole uh, last couple of minutes is volume and hydration assessment. So it's actually really useful in difficult to assess patients or those that are hyper, very hypertensive and they don't appear to be volume overloaded. Another use clinically is to take a look at their volume. So, um, and I, I don't have, I'm not gonna really talk too much about this, but it can be used to kind of the, uh, the volume so, uh, of the person. So compared to the Watson formula, it's an, another alternative to calculate the V. It can also be used as a nutritional assessment, and I have a slide on that. And uh, lastly, it may be useful as a patient education tool. So if you were able to bring a number to your patient and show them, okay, Mr. Smith, you are three liters over, it might compel them to take more fluid off instead of always resisting and uh, saying, I'm gonna, only gonna use my 0.5% bags. Um, so are there actually any studies in peritoneal dialysis? Unfortunately, uh, no. Um, there is one study in progress. It's called the COMPASS trial. It's in Korea, being done in Korea, multi-center there. And what they're trying to compare is bowel impedance versus clinical assessment in guiding volume. Um, so they, they, right now they've enrolled at the time of the, the protocol being published uh, in 2014. They have, they've enrolled 138 patients. So more than uh, more than 180 days on peritoneal dialysis, and they they were randomized to bowel impedance uh, for a year or a clinical assessment of their volume. And clinical assessment is not, is, to be honest with you, when I reviewed the protocol, it wasn't very clear to me how they actually did their clinical assessment. They said blood pressure less than 140 on on 90, no edema, no rails, and uh, they said tar they want their dry weight to be within one kilogram. And I don't know how they got the dry weight, so because they don't they don't do bowel impedance on this group or any other um, solid protocol, so it's not very, very clear to me. But regardless, they followed them for a year, and the primary outcome is the change in GFR. Second is the, and how, how much residual renal function they have, cardiovascular events, and mortality. And so hopefully we'll be seeing the results of, results of this study in the next uh, year or two. It's a one-year study. What is available is hemodialysis studies because well, hemodialysis, uh, there's just uh, quite a bit more data on this. And there's two randomized control trials that looked at the use of bioelectrical impedance in um, uh, guiding volume. In the first study, this one's uh, published in 2014. Uh, it's from, leaves from Romania. 131 patients, again, uh, more than 90 days on peritoneal dialysis, and they were randomized to one of two arms. The first, the top arm, is the open access bowel impedance. So, um, so the patients were, had bowel impedance performed every three months the results of which were used to guide um, target, the target weights. They were brought down to um, the, within 200 milliliters of that, or 0.2 kilograms of that target weight. 
um, on the bottom, the second arm is a blinded axis. So these patients also had bowel impedance performed, but they were, they were blinded to that result. And the physicians were uh, using the clinical assessment to try to find out well, what's the target weight. And, and what the outcome was, was for primary outcome was mortality. Secondary outcome was pulse wave uh, velocity, hydration, blood pressure at two and a half years. The study was actually powered for pulse wave velocity. So it wasn't actually powerful mortality. And what they found was that the bowel impedance group had an additional increase, so both groups actually had a decrease in blood pressure, but the bowel impedance group had extra uh, 2.43 millimeters mercury of blood pressure decrease in the systolic blood pressure, and they had an increase, uh, sorry, a decrease in the pulse wave velocity of 2.7. Mortality is shown in that little um, figure there. Uh, again, I remind you that's not power for that, but what they found was that there was a, uh, there was eight deaths in the very small numbers, eight deaths in the control group, and the bowel impedance group had one death. So when they did the, the statistics, it worked out to be, a, I think it's like 80, 88% reduction in mortality. So again, take it with a grain of salt. Very small numbers we're working with here. The second study, very similar design. Um, 189 patients this time. Again, 90 days on peritoneal dialysis. Again, open access this time every month versus blinded access, so again, they had bowel impedance, but uh, physicians were blinded to the results of that uh, every month. Uh, the outcome was hydration, secondary was blood pressure mortality, and IDH at one year. Um, essentially, in this study, all the outcomes were negative, and the hydration reduction was 52% in the open access and 66% in the blinded group. They didn't really compare the two, but it, it looks, at this point, just looking at the numbers, it looks like a wash. Um, they didn't compare them. Now, what about nutritional assessment? Um, we know that nutrition inflammation is a big, uh, also a big issue in our population. And this study tried to look at that. And what they did was 48 prevalent PD patients. They did bowel impedance and nutritional blood work at baseline. And uh, that includes albumin as well as pre-albumin. And they looked at, then they looked at the outcomes of mortality and nutrition over almost two year time period. And uh, what they were able to find on the right-hand side is they stratified by the phase angle. So remember uh, at the beginning, I kind of mentioned a little bit about the phase angle. So that's the difference in time between resistance and the reactance. And, and this is reported. You don't have to calculate this by yourself. It's a reported number. And they stratified, by, stratified the group to more than six or less than six. And they found that those that had um, less than six uh, for degrees of uh, phase angle had a higher mortality. And when they correlated with other um, more described um, nutritional assessors, such as pre-albumin. Um, they found that it does correlate with pre-albumin as well, and, the, and that's shown on the figure on the left side. It's not a very strong correlation. It looks Again, it looks like someone just did a shotgun blast to the area, but they did report that. So why does the phase angle matter? Well, remember, it's a different, it's a contributing, different contributions of the resistance and the reactance, and because of that, it may actually reflect the cell membrane characteristics and perhaps the fatty acid and con the cholesterol component in the person. This is all hypothesis at this point, not very well described. So it might be useful in nutritional assessment. Well, what about the educational tool? The last thing I talked about, showing your patient that number. It, clinically, I found it helpful when I actually do this for a patient. They, they seem to like, like me a lot better. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they do, they do, I think they're a little bit more compliant when they, uh, when they see that they're, you know, Mr. Smith, you're three liters over. Um, we need to take your target weight down. They're, they're more accepting of that um, for some reason. And, but there's not really any literature on using this as an educational tool. So this might be uh, an area of research in the future. So now I'm, I'm basically finished at this point, but um, just want to summarize really, really quickly on what I talked about. And that's first is what is bowel impedance? Um, the, some of the evidence surrounding it in peritoneal dialysis or the lack thereof, and when to use this in uh, the peritoneal dialysis, mostly in volume assessment, um, helping us guide us a little bit on the volume and perhaps even nutritional and educational tool for our patients. So I'm open to any questions. Thank you.